Hey there, welcome to any of my combo lords joining me. We are here in my room right now because the earlier portion of this stream out in my combo classroom was having some issues with the internet and I was hoping we might have a hair less trouble in here. Today we are just doing a pretty casual extra video for those who want more consolidated facts or whatever. Make sure you're tuned into the main Combo Class channel where we will have an episode again this weekend and had one last weekend. But as far as today's slightly more casual dive into not only this beginning of the title where I noted, ooh, cool, we passed seven to the sixth power of subscribers, which is pretty awesome. And we already in the first half did a little talking about what sixth powers mean. And in case that first half does not process as a video I can include because YouTube sometimes weird with the glitched ones, I will note here again that it's not the seven part of the title that should get the credit. Seven's still my least favorite one digit number. It was the six part that got that into the title. Uh, I'm not even sure if that'll end up in the title, but we were calling it the seven to the sixth power subscriber special, a somewhat notable number for the size. But most of the content of what we've been doing is looking at what could be called mathematical toys. Now, also stuff in my garden and combo class and so on, and other sorts of items or nouns in general, where we're having a slightly more noun focus today. And a lot of our videos don't even necessarily have many nouns unless you are considering the numbers a lot of our videos are stringed together more conceptual things. By noun, I don't literally mean that we're not using nouns in sentences in my normal videos, but that a noun can embody a physical item of sorts. And we have looked at various cool little things in some of the recent streams, such as this Galton board. One of the many things sent to me by one of my Patreon supporters, and very helpful dude, George Carozzi, who sent me some stuff to my private mailbox that is there if any of you have any extra clocks you wanna send. And essentially how this first one works that we've already seen is if I send a bunch of little balls tumbling downward, bouncing off in a semi-random fashion, they will assemble close to what's called a normal distribution or that some know as a bell curve. And these are just some of the cool scientific things that we have gotten, as well as some other packages. Oh, yeah, I need to plug this in. Good, I have my charger. Um, some other packages as well, including one that I got at my mailbox that's not a necessarily a cool science toy. It's from someone else, and is still mysterious to me. So let me plug this in real quick. And one of the nouns is still a bit of a mystery to me because it is inside some boxes. In fact, we'll see why I say boxes instead of box. Well, um, looking at the items that we already looked at in the first portion of this, I do want to re-explain my favorite item of the batch of things that have recently joined our ranks of classroom supplies and that is these 14 metal rings see we got 14 metal rings you got one two three four five six seven eight you can count them there's 14 count them if you want got 14 rings there and the funny thing about my rings here is that, oh, is that they're a cool device called a Toro Flux, where they're actually one long metal coil. It was not 14 separate rings. It looked like 14 rings because it was a coil looped around 14 times. But interestingly, the reason I mentioned 14 is that in this state, there are 13 rings. We've gone from 14 to 13. If you want to see that again, it's true. I'm not just saying this for the heck of it. 
if you ever stumble across one of these yourselves and count them, you'll see there are 14 when it's at this state, and there are 13 when it's at this state. And it's a piece of metal that's coiled around with some interesting properties that I haven't studied to a huge degree. I saw a video about these a while ago, and now that I have received one, I will be looking more into its physics and to how it's able to do this. It is interesting how as we start to uncoil it, it forms a toroidal shape, meaning donut-like, and the donut shape is known as a torus mathematically. And so we have a toroidal sort of spiral. And then if you put it in this position and it's too low, it wants to sink back into the coils. It won't stay up, it'll flatten. And if you put it in this position and it's high enough, it wants to go that way. Pretty neat, and I know I'm definitely gonna prank some friends with this one. Gonna, you know, walk into a room, pretend it's some rings, and be like, whoa, what happened? Oh man, we're never gonna get that cool thing back. Whoa, whoa, what happened again? And we'll figure out some fun pranks. Now, this Toro Flex, I also got out again, not just to re-show in case that earlier portion of this video does not make it into the saved stream universe, which YouTube's sometimes weird when it's half my fault because the internet glitches and then it gets weird in the processing. We'll see. I try and make all my streams available publicly, but what I do need to know is right here, how this is going to spin in a really cool way down this stick. So these Toro flexes, when I had this in the earlier stream, a bunch of people were saying, put it around your arm. Let me get, yeah, there's a lot of light hitting us right at that one angle. I'll just block that sunbeam. So a lot of people said, put it on your arm because it would like ripple down in a cool way. Um, let me shut these a little bit so we're getting less blasted by the sun. Okay. Now, I have something better than an arm in terms of that, which is this long, thin stick that we're going to see a slinky-like property of the Toro Flux on. So, we take our Toro Flux and we pop it open and I'm going to set it on top right here. We got to open it up a little bit so it has so that we can get it around. All right, there's a way to get this on. We made it work pretty cool with a broken whiteboard out there. We can make it work with this actual stick. Um are we there? Maybe that's it. Okay, might be in, might be good to go. All right, so let's see if this can work. Um, I could, I wasn't really keeping my eye on that. What did that look like? I was focused on something else. There, we made it work really cool when we put the tour. Okay, we'll flatten it and put it on. Now we'll be sure it's on. This will make it work. We're going to flatten it, pop it on, and now it's ready to go. It's not doing its spiral thing. Maybe I need to give it a spin. <laughs> it collapsed. Okay. So, I'm not sure if you can see that. If you get a spin on it, it does this really weird slinky-like thing. But it's not just the spin. It was working better on the wider one. Maybe I need to get that broken whiteboard again. Oop. Okay, in any case, we will test the sliding properties of the Toro Flux more in the future. For now, we will, and I'll get a better view of that in slow motion and stuff. But someone says do it at an angle. Okay, I'll try that. We'll try it at an angle. 
go ahead and get it on there. Let's see. We got to flatten it. Sort of bend it to flatten it. I'm going to pop it on. Get it on and then put it at an angle. Whoa, yeah. You see that? That's pretty wild. Could you see that? Okay. We'll try it again. Make sure that was visible because that was really cool looking. Good idea to John Flanagan for the angle. And we, whoa, yeah, you see that? And we can even make it go back and forth. That's how we can keep it going for a while. I can have it going back and forth. When it rolls, it wants to like slide in this super spinny way due to the coils. That looks really weird on the inside. It like creates sort of an optical illusion of this shape, like almost like a bubble. I'm not sure if you folks can see it at all. I'll get a better view of this on a better camera in slow motion sometimes so we can see exactly what's going on. In any case, pretty neat that it can do all that. And then you can pop it out and you can flatten it. So, there's your Toro Flux. Maybe that's how you should uh, carry it around. If you put it around your arm here, you can go like. That's pretty neat. So, these are awesome. Uh, thank you to George Carosi for sending that, as well as some other things like this little cube that can go into a bunch of different shapes due to what the box claims is 36, which is a good number, great number to pick, 36, and it's not that they picked it and then made that amount of magnets, it's that it's a great number because it's fundamental and they had to use an amount of magnets and one of the fundamental numbers came up two times three times two times three or something made that many magnets but they do claim 36 rare earth magnets hmm rare earth magnets you say and as i noted earlier i'll quickly note again that and by earlier i mean in that last part of the stream that <laughs> this seems like either neutral or bad to call yourself an earth magnet. First of all, I don't know what a rare magnet means, but an, a rare earth magnet. To What is an earth magnet? It, either all magnets are earth magnets, which it seems like to me, like magnets are made of earth. They're, it's rock. Either all magnets are earth magnets, so it's not much of flex. Or some magnets are not earth magnets. That implies something like space magnets, if you're talking about like Earth versus the solar system, or if you're talking about like four elements Earth, that implies like air magnets or something. So then it's saying like you have the less cool type of magnet. If there's Earth magnets and space magnets, why are you saying you got the Earth ones? The space magnets would be the cooler ones. So <laughs> don't know about these rare Earth magnets. Let me know when you get some rare space magnets. However, I've I've been playing with this the whole time because it can go into a bajillion shapes. And in this case, bajillion means some, I don't know, some large two digit number or something. But it does have a lot of formations it can go into such as, why is this, something's, there we go. Whoop. How can I get that one that was cool? Cause like you gotta like play weird games to get it in the right spots. Some of them might be like secret codes you gotta hack to get it. So, um, in any case, these are two of the new things that I received. There's also another one that will be cooler at night that I also need to look a little more into how to use. So there's another fun device there. And then there's a slightly more mysterious one. Now, the slightly more mysterious one 
is came from somebody else and they did write a note and could I bring the note in hopefully? Maybe I left the note outside. Um, all right. No, here's the note. So, it's a very cryptic note I got that's, um, I won't read the whole thing, but it begins, to the man with the dice who loves numbers so nice. And then there's some kind of cryptic stuff. There's something about vowels where it goes into different vowels and says, A equals ah, as in ba ba or the sound a sheep makes. E equals a, eh, as in how Canadians end sentences. Or as it was like a, eh, as in how Canadians end sentences. Or as a in the word say. I equals e, as in the word seek or as Y in the name Mary. O equals O as the letter itself or as O in hope. U equals U as when a ghost says boo. Y equals this will be covered in the other package. So, and then there is another package and it says in this letter, I did ask for them to send the package extra slowly. So, the package is supposed to have come after this. Uh, I, I did end up picking them up at the same time, but I read them in the right order. So I was like, okay, the letter, um, interesting clues. I love clues. Uh, I've always been a fan of looking for clues. So this is cool. This is neat. And I'm not sure if um, the guy wants me to fully shout out his name or not. It is from somebody named Guy. So when I say the guy, it is somebody named Guy. So thank you, Guy, for whatever this is about to be. And I partially opened the box that came already, but I need to show you why I stopped when I was partially opening and decided to save it for the stream. Now, if also if Guy is around and is watching this at any point, feel free to comment your whole name or other name you like to use if you want me to shout that out as well. Now, the reason why I started to open the package, and then I was like, I should open the rest of this on stream, because a lot of the time, uh, I'm not sure which packages I'll open directly on stream or which ones beforehand I'll check what's in them. Often I might, you know, check what it is to see how it relates to the stream or what. But in this case, I had to stop and finish on the stream because I opened the outer thing. And when I opened the outer thing, it was this giant thing of ice cream. And at first I was like, did the dude really send me ice cream? Like, for a second I thought this might actually be ice cream. Uh, out of all the things to send to the mailbox, if you're gonna pick an edible thing, it better last a long time, you know? If you pick an edible thing, it better be some, like, new type of beef jerky or raisin that lasts, like, ten years or something. Ice cream is, like, the quickest food to spoil and, like, the messiest. So, yeah, I was like, okay, did I get ice cream? That's gonna be... Uh, insane thing to unwrap is it gonna drip everywhere and then i was like it's probably just a box he used to package something and then so i opened it and i'm like there's probably something else that this fellow wanted to send to me inside there and i opened the ice cream box and inside of the ice cream box there's a raisin bran box <laughs> so i was like what Okay, we got a boxes and boxes situation. I don't know how far this rabbit hole goes. This could have an endless amount of boxes with nothing at the end. This could have a bunch more boxes with something inside the last one. This could have something directly in it and be the last box. This could even have Raisin Bran in it. And so I was like, 
All right, I don't know how far this box in box thing goes. I better do the rest of the box in boxes on stream just in case there's more funny stuff or interesting stuff. <laughs> so thank you to Guy for sending this. I always like a nice game. And the other things we got here are sort of like um, actual little games of sorts. This is sort of a meta game we got right here. So let's see what's inside this Raisin Bran box. And if it's actually Raisin Bran, that would almost be the funniest thing, but I hope it's not. Don't send me Raisin Bran, I'll spoil. But I would kind of crack up if it was actually Raisin Bran. It could also just be boxes and boxes forever. So I'm looking for something sharp to open this with. Okay. Got a key. And we're going to see what is in here. So, here's our Raisin Bran box. And inside... Okay, there's no more boxes. There is something directly in here. All right. There is a lot of paper. There is a lot of info in this. This is really a clue. So you know how I said I like clues? Well, this has got to be one of the bigger clues I've ever found where, I mean, obviously it was sent on purpose, but there's a lot of paper in here. And there's other stuff too, it seems. But the first one I pulled out from here says, summary of results, prime located. N equals this, G equals this, da, 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 da. Digital expression of this in base 71,092. This is the information I'm finding on here. It's very cryptic and interesting. So it's some printouts of some program running do something related to primes in different bases. How primes are written in different bases. And there's other types here that are also seem to be printouts of different primes in different bases. So there's a lot of digits on parts of these. Now, we've gotten a lot of different printouts of programs running stuff. Def recombobulate, recombo, yeah, recombobulator. It just throws me off to see that word recombobulator because it looks like combo. We got combo in there. Recombo Bulator. Um, so what's the rest of these papers? Okay, so here there's one that actually explains some backstory. Now, it says, There's a phonetic base 120 system called phonumerals that this fellow has invented. And it says, I'm signing this with the name of the scholar. I guess I'll say the same. I'll say the name here because it's apparently the name of the scholar. I don't know what that's referring to, which is Guy Flamande. And there's, down here it says 105. And maybe the 105 turns into guy or something. Or maybe there's another clue. So these are quite mysterious. 
we have and I think the name I'm shouting out might not be this fellow's actual name so if you're the one who sent this a this is really cool this is right up my alley very cool b let me know in a comment at some point if you want me to show people all of it that i think includes your name and stuff or if you just want me to give them a summary these ones look really wild it's like these fields of zeros with numbers in it this is just full of clues now there's a phonetic base 120 system but there's also a bunch of other paperwork of all sorts and it's something to do with primes and different bases so I'm definitely going to have to sift through this more. I'm quite interested. So to whoever has um, sent this, feel free to message me or leave a comment or something. Um, if you'd like, I can show this more directly to the stream sometime. But I'll definitely at least run through it on my own and see what's the deal with all of these primes and stuff and how this phonetic base 120 system works. Apparently it relates to the combination of a D20 and a D6 and relates to the fact that there are about 20 consonant sounds and about six vowels in the English language. In fact, there's exactly 20 consonants and six vowels in English. So we're going to have to look into that. That's pretty neat. Now, there is more in here. If there's something else, maybe. What's this thing? This is. And can anyone leave a guess? I think you might be able to guess. Leave a guess if you want. It is a clock. So, we got another clock for our clock quest to add to our collection. And that gets us up to maybe about 42 or 43 clocks. Not sure exactly how many we're at. So, that's pretty neat. Here we got our miniature clock. And we got a wild amount of interesting files, I would call these, or documents. This is like the type of thing that happens in one of my books that I write. Like in the fiction I write, a pile of important paperwork is definitely a type of thing that could occur. Now, lots of cool stuff to flip through here. So, shout out to the fellow who did this. Like I said, leave me a comment if you want me to shout out more of your name or whatever. And also, of course, shout out to George Carosi, who's been sending us the things such as the Toro Flux. Now, most of what I wanted to do in this stream related, oh yeah, clock talk right at the hour. The hour just hit. What hour are you all at? For me, it is 5 p.m. or as some know it, 17 o'clock. Now, most of this stream was to just show some simple items like this, as well as discuss some things about sixth powers. Since I'm not um, sure if the first half of this will process where we were out in the combo classroom, I will note that I'll make an episode about sixth powers at some point. But the core idea I mentioned about them then, which is something that I would like all of you to try and think about on your own, about try and get this to sink in in a core way, is that the sixth powers are precisely the numbers that are both a square and a cube. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense, but we don't really think about it in a geometric way. Square numbers and cube numbers we can visualize by assembling items to be like a square or cube and the amount of items that could be assembled into a square or cube are the sixth powers somebody's asking about uh, whether a certain book is a good introduction to number theory 
I have not read all of that specific book, so I'm not sure what my full recommendation would be. Um, I have recommended a few number theory books I like in the past, and I will note again one that came up on the Discord again for the Combo Class Discord, good place for people to chat. One thing people were mentioning was book recommendations, and one that I always recommend is for people who like my videos about numbers, The Book of Numbers by John Conway and Richard Guy, which is um, a somewhat lighthearted yet very deep look into some similar types of number theory concepts that I enjoy and gives some people not like you've necessarily understood everything. It's less of a textbook, but gives you a pretty good surface level understanding of some of the coolest patterns in number theory. Another one that I've been enjoying a lot that I'm still actually reading. I don't think I finished all the chapters in this. It's a pretty dense one, but fun is this one called Recreations in the Theory of Numbers. If anyone wants to read a book that I'm still finishing, you could uh, read this one. I've been having fun with it. And in fact, I have... I put it aside for a while, so I need to jump back into it. I read most of it a little bit ago. But when I read most of it, like half a year or a year ago, it taught me some new facts. I learned some stuff from that book. Someone uh, to whoever's calling me handsome, thank you so much. Hopefully that will help me find love someday. Um, in any case, the Toro Flex is my favorite, oh, and maybe tied with the stack of documents, is my favorite of the new things. And we're gonna try a few more Toroflex experiments while we chat. Mostly just that I wanna have this assembled as we chat so that I can do this whirly action that I was really good at. And some other authors that I've recommended in the past that are always good if you like my videos are, and let me grab an example of each. Uh, this guy, Clifford Pickover, is great if you like. A lot of the next few I'm going to show are sort of what you could call recreational math. It's not going to teach you the full-on understanding of a given topic. It's going to show you a lot of fun different things. So Clifford Pickover is a good writer for that. So is, where are these others? Okay, I can't. There's a big pile of books that is going to topple if I take it apart. But the other two that I've mentioned are Martin Gardner and Raymond Smullyan are some of my favorite writers. Reading is good for the brain. Reading, and I think that not only reading one way, but reading different ways can be good. Like people are really used to reading online and sometimes mixing it up with a paper book can actually put your brain in a slightly different meditative learning zone that I find helpful sometimes, sort of meditative to read. Now, in this stream, we're actually going to wrap up before too long because most of what I wanted to do worked a little better outdoors. We were going to set up some plants in the combo classroom. However, I did actually bring one of the plants in to show here. And the plant that I'll show here relates to my cats. I tried to show this at the end of the last section as we started glitching. And what I have here is a strange thing that was called cat grass that I had to get and try planting just to try out. Now, cats eat grass. They have this weird evolutionary genetic desire to chew grass sometimes. I've seen my cats do it. And they, it's not good for them really. It makes them want to throw up. It makes them sick. But they have the evolutionary desire possibly because of that one of the theories as to why cats like to eat grass is that big jungle cats and which are could be are the whatever the ancestors of modern cats are 
would eat entire animals, including parts that weren't supposed to be digested, and they wanted to throw up certain parts of the animal. So the grass actually helped their process. But modern cats eat this fancy food. When you look at the food my cats eat and you look at the ingredients of it, I swear it's nicer than the food I eat. Cat food, apart from the really cheap cat food, like any decent cat food is always like, we have made this from bacon wrapped prawns draped in lobster grease. It always is like way better looking ingredients than any human food. But that's okay. Cats are awesome and deserve it. My cats do cool things. And to help them not eat the grass, apparently this stuff called cat grass can be a different sort of grass like plant that if the cats eat that, it's not as hard on their stomach. Now, here is some cat grass. I don't actually know what species it is, because when I bought it, it says multiple species go into cat grass. It's different types of greens that cats wouldn't mind eating. But here, if you look at it, it looks like one plant doesn't look like multiple types of green. All of these fronds look the same. So I don't know which one it is. If you look up cat grass, you'll see a few suggestions of commonly used ones. It's basically grass-like stuff that doesn't hurt their stomach. I don't know if it attracts them anyway, like catnip or whatever, where they prefer to eat it. And we're gonna have to see that because there's a chance it's only for indoor cats and that indoor cats eat it because they have no other grass around. My cats have access to grass. They got all sorts of lawns they wander around. They have my yard and the neighbor's yards. So they're gonna eat grass if they want. The question is, do they prefer this to grass? We will have to run a slow experiment. I split the cat grass in half. So half the cat grass is in the front yard and half the cat grass I replanted in this which will go in the combo classroom and that will maybe give the cats a good snack while they join us for our lessons and not hurt their stomach as much, maybe even attract them more. Now, an interesting thing I've learned recently too is catnip isn't the only drug-like thing that you can give cats that, and safely make them playful. In fact, there's one that some people say makes cats feel better afterward. I don't know if it's they get like less of a hangover or whatever, but there's one that's supposed to be almost a purer form of catnip for how it interacts with their brain, and it's called silver vine. It's actually a root or maybe a branch or trunk or something, a part of some sort of kiwi plant. And this specific sort of kiwi plant called silver vine, if you, or that is one of the nicknames, and to see technically silver vine is called Actinidia polygama, and it makes the cats go wild. I have some sticks of it I got from someone, and my cats love it. They'll roll, you put the stick on the ground, it's like this little stick. They roll around with it like cat and they have to go playful with this stick and they can batter it around and play with it. Way neater. You don't have to like figure out what am I going to put the catnip on? Is it going to get spread all around? Too much, too little. You just give them a stick and they can bat it around while they're having fun with it. So that's something to think about if you are a cat owner, if you want to try any experiments with me. Uh, silver vine and cat grass. Who knew? And... That may give our cats a pretty luxurious seeming life, but we gotta treat them well. They give us a lot of good cat meows, also known as cameows. So, that was the main part of what I wanted to show in this stream was the cat grass, the Toro Flux, and something that was just outside, which we'll have to check out next time, which is the potato that's in the back planter of the classroom has grown this huge sprout. And so what we'll do is wrap up the stream somewhat shortly while uh, playing more with this Toroflex thing. 
And I'm going to have to see if I can get the first half of the stream processed right or if YouTube's going to be weird with that because sometimes they are when it gets glitchy like it did. But in any case, make sure you're tuned in to whatever bonus videos I'll be putting out throughout this week and definitely to the Combo Class channel because last week, uh, last weekend, I put out an episode you should make sure you've seen about prime factorizations and taking them further. And this next weekend, we'll have another mathy episode there. We've been doing a lot of streams recently on this channel as opposed to finished videos, but I have been working on some for that combo class channel. And the next one's filmed and currently being edited. And it will be another clock-like one. And what it will relate to will be taking clocks like that stranger one on the wall there, which is my root of unity clock. Maybe I should hang my subscriber plaque up there somewhere. A lot of people have those hang in the background, but it might seem, it doesn't fit in the combo class, it'll get ruined. But we just got this recently, fellas. Maybe we should hang that in the background. Um, in any case, we got my root of unity and stuff, and Clocks will return, not the root of unity, but we are going to do the fourth main operation, which we haven't done yet on clock math. Clock math meaning modular arithmetic. And modular arithmetic that works like clocks, we've talked about a lot on these channels because I find it just to be a nice, neat way to phrase many patterns. But we've only done three operations with it. We've done addition, subtraction, and multiplication. We haven't even done that much subtraction. It's mostly been addition and multiplication. So we are going to look in the episode at modular division, which is a different sort of division that works on clocks and gives you wacky, cool, unique answers and methods. And we're also on that journey of that episode, we're going to be looking at which of the four main operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, have the property where we could call them close or for those four operations, which sets of numbers such as the integers or the positive integers or the rational numbers or a certain mods numbers, the minute numbers on a clock. We're going to be doing minutes on a clock as the clock math this time, not hours, minutes. Turned out to make the math better when I was brainstorming to do it in terms of minutes. And we'll learn uh, which sets of numbers like that for those four operations maintain being closed in terms of if you apply the operation to any two members of the set, you get another member of the set. So that's an interesting thing for you folks to think about which realms of number are closed or not under addition, under subtraction, under multiplication, under division, stuff like that. And as we do that, we will see how we can use division without breaking any rules, just by stretching the rules in a way that does work, and redefine division, where in terms of minutes on a clock, we our divisions will have other cool things. I can take divisions that normally would need a fractional answer and express them in terms of a whole number because we're only going to be talking about everything's going to find a way to turn into a whole number because it's the minutes on a clock. And there's the minutes don't have any that are written two and a half or whatever. So if we're not talking about the seconds and we're just talking about the minute numbers on a clock, we know that our methods will eventually send us where everything's a whole number and everything's between zero and 59 if I apply something fairly to a minute. Otherwise, I would just have to say it's not on one of the minutes. If it's on one of the minutes, it's a whole number from zero to 59. So that will be fun coming this weekend. There will also be a lot of other random content as usual coming, but I am gonna wrap up this stream in a moment because I mostly wanted to share the Toro Flux and such. Unfortunately, we'll have to see if the first half of the stream when I did a little more detail about some of the new stuff we received and about the sixth powers, process is right, and if it can be saved in a watchable form or if it just saved part of it. 
If this is the only part, I will note that we did just pass seven to the sixth power subscribers, which was in the title and might not be in the title of this half. And sixth powers are pretty cool. And let's keep an eye out for those. We don't need to keep an eye out. We could call seven to the sixth power a member of two types of family. It's a member of the powers of seven and it's a member of the sixth powers. Now we don't need to keep as much of an eye out on the powers of seven. It's all right if we lose track of those. They're, they're you know, more useful than the powers of 13, but there's not gonna be that many times where the powers of seven are gonna come up in an episode. However, the sixth powers could come up in a bunch of episodes. So we will keep our eyes peeled for those. I hope everybody, everybody is having a great day and that you've all seen the new combo class episode or newish, the prime factorization one. I'm gonna log off our stream now, but I do love you all so much and I'll be back on for some bonus content that I'm gonna make sure to film most of my good stuff in that form until I get ethernet cables for the streams because although it was working pretty good while we were in my room today, I think, when I was out in the combo class for the first half, it was not working very good. So we are going to switch these over to Ethernet sometime soon and find a way to make them not glitch. We are in grade negative two. More coolness and more properness in terms of trying to make our stuff always look good and sound good and be not glitchy. But we'll still have our combo class themes and such. So love you all. Stay tuned for all of that stuff. And let's get one last appreciation for both this rare massive stack of documents and which is literally like something out of one of my books, a stack of documents about a computer running tests about primes. That is straight out of one of my books. So sometimes the stuff I write shows up in my real life. I wrote in one of the books I'm writing starts with a divide by zero error. And I wrote that before I ever filmed the divide by zero short that got me like a quarter of the subscribers on this channel. It's like four times more views than any other video. So out of all the 300 shorts I made, it was the one that blew up was something weird from my book. But uh, that also is reminiscent. This is one last look at our cat grass and one last look at, I actually didn't mean to grab that. I meant to see the Toro flux, but the Toro flux shrinks as soon as you're done with it. It gets tiny. Where'd the Toro flux sneak off to? It can't be far, but you know that Toro flux, when it's big, it's easy to see, but now it must be in its coiled. Okay, here it is all coiled up and hiding from me. So, <laughs> Once again, not a product placement or anything. These were just sent by a helpful viewer, but I like the Toroflex. They're pretty cool. If you like fiddling around with stuff, I would get one. Actually, I don't know how much they cost, so I don't know if I recommend it or not, but I do know they're fun. So, yeah, let's give a shout out to the guy who invented this. Who's the guy who invented this? Uh, let's see. The guy who invented it is Jochen, Jochen, Jochen Valet, Valet, Valet. Don't know how to pronounce either of that guy's names, but it says uh, there are various brands that make the Toro Flux. So, oh no, they manufacture it under a different name. So here's the history. It says this was invented in the mid nineties. And then in 2010, a company bought the rights to this and presumably the name. So it says other brands make it under other names. So, you know, maybe you don't need to get a tor the one called a Toro Flux. Maybe you just need to get one that says, I do the th same thing. One more time with the paradox too. 14 rings. 13 rings. So the reason for that is because how many rings are there really? 
one ring. It's all one piece of metal. It's not 13 or 14. But it can coil into ways that make it 14 coils or depending how you define this 13 coils or I could almost see this as defined as 26 coils I don't know there's sort of like two points right here that are doing stuff whatever you call this so thank you for joining me I'll catch you all in the next one and I'm going to check if that earlier half of this stream can get fixed or not and you can find me on the Discord, Patreon, 